This evening's speaker is Dr. Stephen Lexen, Emeritus Professor of Anthropology here at CU Boulder and former Curator of Anthropology at the campus's Museum of Natural History. He was also President of the Boulder AIA Society for many years, all of which I'm sure factored into his generous offer to give the inaugural lecture of this series in our exciting new format. His accomplishments in the field of archaeology are extremely impressive. He has directed no fewer than 20 major projects in the American Southwest, including at Chaco Canyon and Chimney Rock, the former of which was the focus of his doctoral research at the University of New Mexico. His interest in ancestral Pueblo and particularly Chacoan architecture has permeated his work, having authored numerous books, chapters, and articles on this subject over the course of his career. Although the theme of his lecture tonight um, is architecture, his scholarship has also covered an exhaustive range of cultural and historical topics in Southwest archeology, span including houses and households, population movements, and structures of political power. In addition to an abiding interest in the role of archeology span in contemporary American intellectual life. His lecture tonight is entitled, Three Doors, Tri Walls, and Subfloors. Southwestern examples of clunky evidence in the age of big data. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Steve? So am I coming through? Let me start by saying that uh, I'm not sure what the audience is seeing. Uh, on my screen, we have my face and a couple other faces. Uh, if my face gets in the way of what you want to see on the, on the screen, you can drag it out of the way. Or if you're just tired of looking at it, which I wouldn't blame you a bit, just drag, drag the face out of the way, up, up down, left, right, whatever. Um, so I'm talking tonight about the Southwest, uh, which all of you know where that is, because uh, we're not quite in it, but we're just north of it. Uh, places like Mesa Verde and Chocolate Canyon and Rocky May, which we'll get to in a bit. And there's some preliminary work we need to do here that uh, first we need to vacate our minds of stereotypes of modern Pueblos. Uh, this would be a um, sort of idealized Pueblo painted by Fred Cabote, the, the Hopi artist, of um, simple uh, communal fishing, fishing, excuse me, farming villages <laughs> um, held together basically by religion and ceremony, um, which, you know, is true of a lot of modern Pueblos. Uh, they're independent. Uh, there's, you know, they're not one Pueblo in charge of other Pueblos, and each one is a standalone. Um, and that's kind of what they are like. I mean, there's a lot more to them, obviously, uh, today, but that's not necessarily what they were like in the past. Uh, the past was different even though the past is part of modern Pueblo heritage, for sure. So uh, open your minds here. And some more groundwork that, like Gaul, uh, the Southwest has been divided into three parts. Uh, in the north, the Pueblo or ancestral Pueblo used to be called Anasazi. Uh, down in southern Arizona, in the lower left, Hohokam, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, but I'd be glad to come back and talk about that, because Hohokam is really interesting, under Phoenix and Tucson, places like that. Down to the south, uh, what's typically called uh, Maguillon, but it really should be Mogollon, uh, which is the name of a colonial New Mexico governor who used to chase Apaches around down there. He didn't catch many of them, but uh, they named the area for him because he spent so much time bouncing around on a horse. So those three areas, you need to keep those in mind. And those are defined by sort of old school big data, <laughs> which means archaeologists walking along looking at pottery going, oh, the pottery changes here. Um, it changes from Pueblo pottery to Maguillon pottery or from Maguillon pottery to Hoacan pottery. Um, that's how we did it in the old days and sort of looked and saw what was on the ground. So that's kind of old school big data. I'll get back to that in a bit. Okay, you had three principal actors tonight. Uh, Chaco Canyon, which is a national park that flourished from 850 to 1125. And all these are, are current era 80 dates. Uh, then Aztec Ruins National Monument that uh, was being built and, uh, and occupied from 1110 to 1280. 
and then Pakime, which is also called Casas Grandes, which uh, was 1250 to 1450. And um, all three of these are world heritage sites, but more importantly, they're all capitals. And that modern pueblos don't have a capital pueblo. They only have one pueblo in the middle that's in charge of everybody else, even, even loosely. But each one for its time and place uh, was the capital. And there are three different times. You can see that it, it goes bing, bang, boom, Chaco, Aztec, Pakime, they, they pretty much are sequential. Okay, so Chaco and Aztec are up in the Pueblo area, in the old Anasazi area, uh, near the Four Corners, where Pakime is down in Chihuahua, about 60, 70 miles south of the border in Chihuahua. It's still part of the Southwest, or, you know, uh, speaking archaeologically, is our, the, the U.S. Southwest uh, for the Mexicans is their Northwest, because it used to be part of Mexico until we took it away in 1846, which uh, still annoys people. But yeah, so yeah, we have two that are up north and one that's down south, and I'm gonna make an argument that they're historically linked. So Chaco is a pretty arid canyon in northwest New Mexico that doesn't have a lot going for it. Not a lot of water, there's no wood. Uh, it's not a real good place to grow corn, uh, although there's some small faction of archeologists that are trying to convince us all that it, it was. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Um, but that's where they chose to build their first capital. Uh, and they, um, the, the reason it's a national park and a, and a world heritage site are these large buildings. There's three of them here, Pueblo Alto, uh, Pueblo Benito, Chetra Cattle. I worked, worked on all three of them actually. Um, there's Pueblo Benito again that the archaeology jargon is a great house. And these are massive buildings. There are a couple of acres and huge thick walls and they're monumental. As far as the Southwest goes, they're monumental. I mean, not the pyramids of Egypt or anything like that, but they're really built to last, which is why they're still standing three or four or sometimes five stories tall. Uh, a lot of labor goes into these things. Uh, they're big. Um, at the same time, and, you know, what makes them truly remarkable is at exactly the same time, and before and during and after Chaco, normal people were not living in these things. This is, the great house is not a, a farming village. The great house is a great house. Uh, normal people are living in what you're seeing on the lower right there, unit pueblos, uh, called unit pueblos. Uh, again, that's jargon, but they each consist of five rooms in a kiva, four rooms in a kiva, five rooms in a kiva, six rooms in a kiva. It's, it's almost like a rubber stamp. And what you're seeing there are, are a couple of rows of these things that are right across the canyon from Pueblo Benito, occupied at exactly the same time, okay? Um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, much, much smaller scale. Um, for the unit Pueblo, you could take the whole floor area of, a, that's a family house, five rooms in the Kiva, it's a family house, single family house. You could take the floor area of that whole building and fit it in a single room at a great house at Pueblo Benito. I mean, the differences in scale are just smack you upside the head obvious. And what that's telling us, I'm fairly certain at this point in my life, is that you have two classes of people in Chaco Canyon. You've got nobles who are living in a palace, what would be called a palace anywhere else in Mesoamerica. And you know, Mesoamerican palaces don't look like this, but they have palaces for the nobles and commoners. Uh, and the, the math works out fairly well. You get the nobles are the one percenters and the commoners are the 99 percenters. When you see you know, how many people are living in, different kinds of houses. The Chaco itself was a regional center, like I say, as a capital. Its region on this map is all those little red squares and triangles and circles and stuff. Those represent small great houses, uh, like you take a tenth of Pueblo Benito and drop it out there 150 miles away, usually in the middle of a community of unit pueblos. You know, there'll be uh, 50 unit pueblos in a cluster, you know, semi-clustered community and on a hill up above them is a, a great house sort of looming over them. And it's probably some secondary nobility. Um, it's tied together by things we call roads, those red lines. And there's lots more of those uh, uh, that we haven't mapped yet. Um, they look like roads. Uh, these guys didn't have wheeled vehicles and they'd be suburban, but these things look like roads. And they, they link distant points back into the center and they radiate out from chocolate like spokes on the wheel. And a line of sight uh, communication system that we're know from some parts it probably is permeates the entire region but for some parts we know very well with repeater stations like from chimney rock for example there's a repeater station at Werfano Butte 
that would repeat the signal back into Chaco. And these are signals that are being done with, with fire, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> so yeah, it was a system and it was about the size of, of the state of Indiana. This is not a small deal. Chaco maybe had 3,000 people living there, which is okay for a capital, a free, free industrial capital. And the whole area is 60,000 to 100,000 people. So it's, it's not small potatoes. Okay, Aztec ruins. Or I'm just introducing the principle here. Aztec ruins, we know less about. Uh, people have been digging in Chaco for 120 years. Aztec ruins, there's been one major excavation. That was by Earl Morris, whose job I had at the University of Colorado Museum. Uh, he, he was originally there. Um, and he dug one of the great houses at Aztec ruins. And they start building Aztec ruins when they quit building at Chaco. And uh, no diminution in, in scale. Uh, the building you're seeing there is Aztec West, which is the, the one that Earl Morris dug. That was the single biggest construction event that Chaco ever put together. Benito's bigger, but it took him a century and a half to build Benito. This thing went up in like 10 years. So if not Chaco on the ropes, it's Chaco very organized, able to uh, mobilize labor to get the materials, all the beams that you need to get, you know, to build all the uh, roofs and all that kind of stuff. So Aztec ruins, we don't know that much about. And one of the things that's a mystery is, well, if Aztec is a capital, like I said it was, what was its region? Because you're plunking a second capital, you know, a decade later on the same area that Chaco had. And so which of these squares and circles and triangles are Chaco's and which are Aztec's or which are both? And we'll come back to this, we'll come back to this. Okay, finally, Pakime, we know even less about. Uh, one major excavation there by Charles de Peso in the 1960s. Again, this is the one that's in Chihuahua. Um, uh, subsequent work by Paul Menace and Mike Whalen and uh, Jane Kelly and Mexican archeologists from the National Institute and other younger people now are working down there. So we're, we're learning more about it, but it's really uh, less well known than Chaco or Aztec. But we do know, oh yeah, we do know that it was wild. It was wild. Uh, at Pakime, you had I-shaped ball courts. So these are the kind of ball courts in shape anyway that you would see at Chichen Itza or Tula. Uh, and colonnades all over the place. And that's a very uh, post-classic Mesoamerican feature. You know, the only other colonnades I'm aware of are Chaco. Um, there's one, um, but there's, there are many of them at, at Pakime. And you know something about its region. I said we know less about it than we know about Chaco and Aztec, but because there wasn't much going on in Chihuahua, there was, you know, there was people in Chihuahua, but there wasn't much going on before Pakime. Um, you got some kind of a handle on the size of its region where the secondary sites and um, the ceramic distributions, all that kind of stuff. Um, again, an area comparable, you know, a little smaller than, than Chaco's uh, uh, region. So you have those three, three capitals. Now let's get into the topic of the night here is clunky data and uh, clunky evidence and big data. The Southwest has a, a history of being innovative in, in techniques and methods not me, but the other guys. Um, and there's a, a passion for big data in the Southwest. I, there is everywhere in the social sciences, but um, very sophisticated projects that uh, uh, use lots and lots and lots of, of data points, um, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands, millions of sherds and sherd counts over thousands of sites, uh, generating really interesting maps, like the one on the right there, or the one on the left. Uh, one in the middle is smaller area uh, of Mesa Verde. And I'll get back to some of these, um, but projects like the Village Ecodynamics Project, uh, Tim Kohler's projects, and uh, Crow Canyon works on that too. Southwest Social Networks, which is a lot of people, but it's very much associated with uh, Barbara Mills down in Arizona, and Cyber Southwest, which is Barbara Mills and uh, Archaeology Southwest, and, and more. There, I'll, I'll mention some other big data projects, which, you know, this is the future, and it's really exciting, and it's a lot of fun. I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm looking at clunky evidence. I kind of like big stuff uh, where there's not so many of them and you can almost know them all individually and personally. Like T-shaped doors uh, and tri-walled structures. Okay, a tri-walled structure, you're looking at a map of a tri-walled structure, which is a circular building with concentric rows of rooms and there are bi-walls and tri-walls and one quadrivall I'm aware of that are just look like uh, uh, targets, archery targets. And finally, um, Subfloor burials, which are not quite as easily visible, but we know where a lot of, you know, we know where people did this, and I'll talk about what subfloor burial means in a bit, um, where they did this, and they didn't do it everywhere in the Southwest. They did it in a couple of very specific locations, which are really, really interesting historically. 
So I'm just gonna go through these one at a time. And T-shaped doors, T-doors, or the tau-shaped doors is what, what Neil Judd called them back in the day. I, they appear to start at Chaco Canyon in the great houses, uh, not in the unit pueblos, but in the great houses. And they almost always are doors that are exterior doors opening onto a plaza. So if you came into the building, you would see these T-doors and you would know that whoever's behind that is a T-door person, whatever that means. Um, you know, that's, that's how they are identifying themselves uh, as, you know, that shape of a door. And when they quit building at Chaco, oh, excuse me, uh, and there's nothing subtle about them. Uh, it's, uh, what I'm calling mega T's are these great big T's that really, once again, are, you know, in your face. Yes, this is a T shape, whatever it meant to those guys, you know, there's going to be no doubt about it. No, no misunderstandings. Um, and Aztec ruins, the T doors are again, plaza facing doors. This is standing in the plaza, looking into the building. And it's all around the plaza, there are these T doors, big T doors. Uh, again, you know, leaving no doubt as to who, what are, what are the identity of the people in that building, the, the T door people, whatever that means. But they get democratized and the unit pueblos start to have T doors. And these, this is a cliff dwelling, Mesa Verde, a spruce tree house. And what this is, is a bunch of little unit um, pueblos stacked up on top of each other and jammed into an alcove. So instead of five rooms in the kiva, you have a bunch of rooms over here and the kiva's over there because that's how it fits in the, in the space. But these are, these are unit pueblos. It's a, a string of unit pueblos, some on the first story, some on the second story. And look at all the T doors. Um, again, facing the, the plaza, facing the direction you'd come. And, and they had the mega T's too. I don't know well you'd see this, but that started off life as a huge T door that you would be able to see from a mile away. And then they narrowed it down to a smaller T door for one reason or another, who knows? You need a Ouija board to figure that one out. And finally, when they leave Aztec and Mesa Verde, those are the same time period. At 1300, tens of thousands of people leave the Four Corners, leave that Aztec's region, whatever that region is. And they don't make T doors in the Pueblo area anymore. They give up on them, they turn their backs on them. They pop up at Pakime, hundreds of miles to the south. And Pakime itself is full of T doors, and both the big mega T door uh, T doors on the exterior, so you can see them when you're coming into the building, and then interior doors, lots and lots of interior T doors. There's almost 570 doors in the part of Pakime that got dug by Charlie the Peso, which is about half of it, I guess. And half of those, half of those doors are T-shaped doors, so the, these guys are really into it. Um, in fact, the uh, you know it's a World Heritage site, the the Mexican um, the National Institute, it runs the wonderful little museum down there. It's not so little, wonderful museum there. And they're very proud of their World Heritage uh, status and the plaque you can see uh, down low there. But they commissioned a sculptor to say, well, you know, what is the symbol of the site that goes with our World Heritage site? And yeah, it was a big, big T. That's a modern sculpture back behind the World Heritage plaque. And they're democratized in, in Casas Grande, the, in Pakime, and the, that's called the Casas Grandes area, um, in the smaller sites, but they haven't dug that many small sites. So where you see them most often is in cliff dwellings up in the Sierra Madres to the west of, of Pakime. I got a chance about a year ago to go up and visit some of these uh, cliff dwellings. And it was really, it was really exciting. It was uh, fantastic scenery and amazing sites. That's a couple of uh, archeologists who work for the National Institute who came along with us on the trip. And you see a big old T door there. And uh, oh, that's uh, Serpiente, and this is Rancherias. Uh, you know, mega T's, great big T doors. Uh, same deal that's going on um, up north, hundreds of miles away, this very distinctive shape. So why T-shaped doors? Well, the, the old Park Service take on this was that, you know, what the rangers would tell you is, well, they had backpacks, they had burden baskets on their backs, and it was just easier to go through a T-shaped door with <laughs> A basket on your on your back, and I think it's a little deeper than that. And the shape actually means something. Uh, the top two there, the one on the left is a Chaco T door. Um, the thing on the right is a mug. Uh, it's a very special vessel form that was only made during Aztec's time. This is after Chaco for about a hundred years, and only in Aztec's region, in the Mesa Verde region. And it looks very useful to us. I mean, it looks like sure, it's a it's a coffee cup. But nobody else in the Southwest thought that that was all that helpful because nobody else ever made them. And after they left the Four Corners, they never made another one of these things. So just for a hundred years, just in that area. If you look at the strap handle there, it's got a little T 
cut in it. And that's not unusual. And not all of the mugs have tea, teas cut in their handles. But enough of them do that, yeah, clearly that tea, nobody's taking a backpack through that little tea opening there, right? It's a symbol. It, it means something to these guys. The bottom two on the left are, are a suite of T-shaped doors at, at Pakimane. And in one of the, the mounds, uh, pyramids at Pakimane, there's an attached room that was a shrine room or an altar room. And they found this altar made of felsite. Uh, and this is a, a mock-up of it on the right, uh, carved in stone. And actually, I think I have, yes, a, an excavation picture of how beautifully this is made. Uh, that sucker is about two feet tall. And nobody's going through that tea door, at least nobody in this world. I was going through that T-door and it's on an altar. So yeah, the T-shape meant something. It isn't a pragmatic thing. It isn't a, a, a matter of convenience. It, the T-shape meant something and it meant who you were. Okay, so they started off at Chaco in the great houses. And this, these are schematic maps in the 11th and 12th century. And in some of the outlying great houses, uh, some of those little squares and triangles and dots I showed you earlier. Then they move up to to Aztec, but they get democratized and all, everybody has them. All the cliff dwellings have them and, and the small unit polos that are out there have tea doors. So everybody, everybody's wearing a tea on their, on, their, on their sleeves at this point. And then after, after 1300, tens of thousands of people, I mean, probably 30,000 people leave this area all at once, which is really quite remarkable in world history. They go to where the Pueblos are today on the Rio Grande, Hopi, Zuni, and they don't make tea doors anymore. They just don't do it. There's a few claims of tea doors in that area and they're special completing, but that, that's when they pop up down south by the hundreds in Pakime. I think that's tracing the political history of the Southwest that you have the first capital, the second capital, and the third, excuse me, going backwards here, second capital and the third capital. Uh, and I think the, the tea, they're showing you that the nobles, Nobles are moving and they're dealing with local populations that have different kinds of architecture, different kinds of pottery. But the fact of being a noble, you know, you don't opt out of that. If you're, if you're a king here, you're a, a king for good or bad. Okay, so this is transgressing the old school big data where we have these culture areas of Pueblo in the north and Mogollon in the south. And I'm saying this historical dynamic crossed those lines. It didn't care about those lines. But the political um, structures and the political history paid no attention to the big data, that the, the clunky data, clunky evidence, the T-doors is showing us a different picture than the pottery show us, which is, you know, the big data evidence. Okay, tri-walls. Um, this is that same map of a tri-wall. This is one at Aztec runs. And this one has been monkeyed with. Uh, it's one of the few that are excavated. Uh, and again, there's only several score of these things out there. I mean, I haven't visited them all, but I could. I mean, you know, it's not impossible. Um, this one is one of the few that's been excavated. I think there are maybe four that have been excavated. And you can see that it had a complicated history where people came back in and messed with it. But at Aztec ruins, this is the second capital, right? 1110 to 1280. And then when they leave Chaco, they move up here. And it's laid out, like Chaco, I didn't get into this, but Chaco has a, a city plan, a cityscape that's very, it's, it's all about symmetries and north-south axes and this kind of stuff. Same with Aztec ruins, but it's all about tri-walls. The thing is laid out around, right in the middle is a quadra wall. It's the mother of all tri-walls. And then there's two tri-walls in the northeast and the northwest that are in opposition to great kibas that are in the two big great houses. And then a road running through that, one of those Chaco roads, up to Aztec North, which is another great house, which is off the, off the picture frame here. It's all about tri-walls. I mean, the tri-walls are central to this place. And I, I will use that as an argument to say the tri-walls are Aztec. That's how we know where Aztec's uh, region is. There's one at Chaco, one tri-wall by-wall at Chaco Canyon. This is Pueblo del Royal. Last thing built there, oh well, among the last things ever built there. And they either didn't finish it or they built it and tore it right back down again. That was the, the opinion of uh, the guys that excavated it back in the 20s and again in the 40s. So there's some interesting history there where Chaco didn't like by walls and tri walls. I mean, they built one and then tore it down. But at Aztec, that's what they did. They did by walls, tri walls, you know, those kinds of things. But they're scattered across the countryside too. This is Mud Springs over near Cortez or over near uh, uh, Mesa Verde. Uh, this is Mitchell Springs over near Cortez. Again, this is, you know, 50 miles away from Aztec ruins. Uh, Holmes Tower, and William Henry Holmes is an early archaeologist. This is on the San Juan River. 
think about as far west as these things get. And I got to see it uh, two months ago uh, on one of my few trips outside the city boundaries of Boulder, where I had to drop some things off in, in Blanding, Utah. Went out and saw this thing. Um, and Holmes, who was, he was an archaeologist, but he was originally hired as an artist and a scientific illustrator. That's his drawing on the left. What he, think, what he thought that thing would look like it was a tower. Uh, and you can still, you know, from, it's much reduced today, but, but you can see what he was thinking about. And there are towers. They do build towers in this area. This one on the right is, a, I think, one from Hovenweep, where they build circular towers. One archaeologist suggested that in the bywalls and triwalls that the center was a tower and that the exterior rings were like a wedding cake, where the exterior is one story and then the, in, the next one in is two stories and the next one in is the tower. And that's a really interesting thing to think about because it would change the way these things look. I'd say the, uh, the jury's out. Some of the evidence supports that, some of the evidence doesn't. But Crow Canyon, and one of the most recent excavations of a, a bywall here, at Yellow Jacket, when this is 60 miles from, from Aztec um, to the west, northwest, way, way, you know, almost into Utah. Um, Kristen Kuckelman, who dug uh, this site, uh, did some work at the Bywall, and she called it a great tower. The central part was a tower, and pretty unambiguously. So, yeah, there may be the wedding cake aspect here. So, what are tri walls? Beats the hell out of me. I don't know. Um, Archaeologists, you know, they uh, came up with an explanation for T-shaped doors, but nobody's really put a handle on these things. One archaeologist suggested that this is where the, the leaders lived, you know, in a little central circular room tower, perhaps, you know, surrounded by storerooms full of goodies. I don't know. Um, there's been so few of them excavated, and the ones that were excavated, some of them were so messed up, you know, it's kind of hard to say what was going on in these things. But it, because they are so central to Aztec ruins layout, literally central, and then define the layout. Um, I, I think you can make a case that they are markers for Aztec's region and polity. Remember, I said a problem with Aztec is you couldn't really tell how big its region was. It's, it looks like a capital, but its region is overlapping. It's, it's set on top of the earlier Chacoan region. So what part of that's Chacos and what part of that's Aztec or what part of it's both? Now let's get back to big data. This is the Southwest Social, Social Networks uh, project, the Bar Mills, Matt Peoples, uh, Archaeology Southwest, and, and a bunch of other people, where they went out and actually got ceramic information and uh, obsidian information on thousands of sites in the Southwest and put it all in, you know, this is really big data. And by big data, it means something you have to put in a computer and use algorithms and crunch. It's stuff you can't do in your head. I mean, I can do T doors in my head because I, or uh, by walls anyway, because um, there's not that many of them. But this you, you have to play games with. And for the era of Aztec, uh, the, what they're showing here are this, what they think are proxies of social connection, connections based on pottery types and, and wares um, shared between paired sites. And it's much more complicated than that, the math is. But the, the map that comes out shows, you know, see where Aztec is there. Pretty clearly a northern network in the four corners and a southern network. Uh, around Zuni and, and down the Puerco of the, of the West. With, and this is interesting because Aztec's right in the middle of it, and this is the era, 1100, 1150, is Aztec at its height. Well, when I map on where by walls and tri walls are, it looks like that, which is pretty cool because it encompasses most of the northern network and a good chunk of the southern network, the most heavily populated part of the southern networks. That based on, on the big data, uh, the ceramics and that kind of stuff, they didn't have that much to do with each other. You know, they, they were more in, uh, focused, the southern group is more inwardly focused on the south as far as ceramics and stuff go, and ditto the north. So you have a political system if tri walls really represent Aztec's region, which is smaller than Chaco's, uh, uh, that uh, incorporated, you know, it was a house divided, as it were. I mean, a, a northern half and a southern half that didn't necessarily pull together, and that may be why Aztec fell. And I will not try and draw any parallels with what's going on in the country today. but. That's big. That doesn't mean that the big data is wrong. Not at all. The big data is what the big data is. It's really interesting. The, the clunky evidence shows us a different pattern, and the two of them together are really fun to think about, both of them together. Okay, subfloor burials. This is uh, not really a burial, uh, not a picture of a real burial. This is a schematic from the early days, uh, Jesse Walter Fuchs, in one of his publications. You living in a room, uh, grandma dies, you dig a hole in the corner, uh, you fold grandma up, 
you put her in there, uh, in that hole, fill it back up again, and you know, put a pot in there with her. And in this case, um, in members, which we'll talk about in a minute, sometimes the pot's upside down over the head. Maybe put a slab over that and then, then uh, plaster the floor off again. And you go on living in a room. So living in a room where grandma's in one corner and Aunt Gertrude's in the other corner and Cousin Joe Bob's in another corner is kind of unusual, kind of unusual. You know, they, uh, for most of these rooms that I'm about to talk about in two areas, that's what they do. These are, they aren't turning the room. They're not stopping use of the room, they're, that, but that's where they bury people. So I'm interested in Pakime, where they did some of this, and I'll get back to that in a minute, that uh, this is the uh, uh, model of Pakime in their museum, and their museum at Pakime on site is just a gem, lovely place. Again, it's 1250, 1450. Um, this is another big data thing, the Coalescent Communities Database, and they tried to reconstruct where population was at any particular time, and they got 1200, 1250, 1350, 1400 on the right, that's, that's Pocky May's era. If you look at 1200 to 1250, there's nobody down there. Pocky May's a little dot in the middle. Okay, but at 1350 to 1450, there's a lot of people, and I think it's seriously underrepresented on, in their database. I think there's just a lot more down there. We just haven't, like I said, we haven't done the survey work, but there's a ton of people down there in the 14th century, and not many people at all in the 13th and, and, and 12th centuries. So where did all those guys come from? Well, we're going to get back to that and subfloor burials, because I think we need to, we in, need to introduce another player, Membrus, up on the top there, 91130. It's exa almost exactly the same time as Chocolate Canyon, far to the north. Um, so Membrus and Pakime, those are the two places they do subfloor burials. Nobody else in the Southwest does subfloor burials, and these guys do lots of subfloor burials. That's what they do. That seems interesting to me because they're neighbors. Uh, members at 100, okay, let me back up here. Members ends at 1130, Pocky May starts off at 1250, so you got a century, a century in between there, okay? Um, that's unaccounted for at this point. But they are neighbors. Um, members is in southwest New Mexico, and its actual region when, you know, it, it's it time, it, its time, which is 100 years before Pocky May, um, actually extended into northern Chihuahua, into the area that would become Pocky May uh, 100 years later, and, and the Casas Grandes region. Uh, which is what you call Pocky Mace uh, quality. So members you may know from its pottery, pretty flashy stuff. Um, uh, we like it a lot. Uh, nobody else liked it then. Uh, you know, you don't see that members pottery does not move outside the members area. Uh, the stuff with all these pictures on it, I think is highly ideologically charged that you didn't want to eat your Wheaties out of that unless you were a members person and you understood what it meant. Uh, Choco, exactly contemporary with it, could have anything it wanted. It had chocolate, it had macaws that had what you know copper copper bells and all kinds of stuff at Chaco and Chaco didn't want any of this you know and they flipped thousands of shirts millions of shirts of Chaco and there's hardly any members there at all exactly contemporary member sites don't look like much you know they're big villages uh, but they are farming villages and they don't seem to have gotten into the nobles and commoners thing that, are, that everybody else is engaged with but uh, they don't look like much um, Ansel Adams never took a picture of a member site and Pocky May does. I mean, Pocky May, which follows members by 100 years, is monumental. It's huge. It's not made out of sandstone like Chaco, because um, this isn't sandstone country. But it's made out of this massive uh, poured adobe and stood four or five stories tall. And it looks kind of like a Pueblo. I mean, it's massed like a Pueblo where you have terraced rooms and all that kind of stuff. Okay, now the subfloor burials. This is a, the best excavated, most, most thoroughly excavated members village. And you can see they're not huge. Uh, not small either, but um, all those little dots, those are burials. They had almost a thousand burials at Swartz Ruin in the Members Valley. Um, and almost two thirds of them, no, almost 90% of them uh, uh, were subfloor. You see all those, I don't know how well you can see this, but those, you see the outlines of rooms and then the rooms are just polka dotted with dead people under the floor. Um, about 10% were similar kinds of burials, but out in the plazas. Okay, let's jump to Pocky May. Again, 100 years later, but exactly the same pattern. Subfloor burials in rooms that are being used. They had almost 450 burials, and almost two thirds of those are subfloor, you know, in rooms that are being used in the corners, just exactly like members, in the corner with a pot and the floor plastered over again. Now, this is 
peculiar is not the word I should use because I mean this is a, you know a very important uh, part of uh, the social identity is how you treat your your dead. And for members and Plucky me, they treated them exactly the same way. And it's really interesting because nobody else in the Southwest does this. And I don't think anybody in Mexico does this, where you know the burials are in the in the house under the floor in quantities. <laughs> you know, there's some that are outside and there's always a few odds and ends. But um, elsewhere in the Southwest, they bury people in middens, which is not a sign of disrespect. The midden is uh, it's trash, but we call it trash. But it's where you deposited stuff that was no longer functioning in this world. And it, um, talking to public people, yeah, you, you put uh, busted out pots there, you put last night's dinner there, you put grandma there. They don't do that today, but, but that's because they're all going to come back. And a pot will come back as another pot, a deer will come back as another deer, grandma will come back as a baby. So, yeah, the middens up north, and cemeteries, there are many, many parts of the southwest that had formal cemeteries. And some intramural, and that's not subfloor, but in a room, where, but where you take a room, put the, the dead person on the floor with all the offerings, and then you seal the room off. The room becomes a tomb, and that's a different deal than what I'm talking about. So, what's up with subfloors? Uh, I think there are a very strong link between members and Pakime. But there's a hundred years in between. And I'm worried about, you know, where all those people come from that the big data show us at Pocky May when there weren't a whole lot of people there before. The members, probably not 10,000 people. There's probably 6,000 members people, but I just put 10,000 up there. They're on the safe side. And at Pocky May, by 1250, 1300, there's tens of thousands, many tens of thousands of people, not all in Pocky May itself, but in this region. Pocky May is probably you know, 3,000 people, about the same size as Chaco, maybe 5,000 people, the, the capital. Um, but you got a century in between the two, and, and the evidence of the subfloor barriers is really compelling because nobody else does this. It's really strange. Well, strange is the wrong word, but it's really unique. Um, and, you know, it's unique to those two things that were neighbors and overlapped, uh, not in time, but in space. Well, there's an intermediate phase. It's called the Black Mountain phase that, that uh, fills that gap. But nobody's really looked at it because it doesn't have flashy pottery <laughs> and it doesn't have flashy sights. There's a Black Mountain site. This is the Black Mountain site, the, the type site, uh, the, the, the site for which the thing was named. And that's Black Mountain off in the upper left-hand corner. It's an old volcano. It's in the Deming Deserts. I mean, you can't see a tree from there, even with binoculars. Um, it's big, and people knew about it, but nobody's ever poked around in it because these guys quit painting pottery. Uh, they don't have flashy pottery. The sites aren't, uh, the sites are big but they don't look like much. You have to really dig and you can see some walls there. Right? Even when you get them exposed and this is work that was done by Katie Putsavage from, uh, and I helped uh, from the University of Colorado. But you know, there's only been a few people that got interested in Black Mountain, Daryl Creel, uh, Matt Taliaferro and Katie. And so, you know, it hasn't been investigated very much. Just a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, but Black Mountain, uh, is a big site. It wouldn't handle 6,000 members people, but there are more big sites that are out in the desert. It's like members sinks to the south, goes away from the members valley, which is this nice watered mountain valley, the trees, all that kind of stuff, out into the desert. And they wander in the desert for 100 years. And I think they finally landed at, at uh, Pakime and become part of the population of Pakime. Burials at Black Mountain? Katie didn't find any. We didn't find any here, but in the few other Black Mountain sites that are excavated, they have subfloor burials. So that's what's going on there, that the subfloor burial tradition is starts in Membris, it gets uh, perpetuated through this intervening phase of Black Mountain, and then it pops up again at Pakime, because I think a lot, not all, but a lot of the base population for Casas Grandes and Pakime are those six, what's left, you know, the grandchildren, great-grandchildren of the 6,000 members people that we had to get rid of at 1130. You know, where are they going to go? Well, they pop up down there at Pakime. Um, Black Mountain itself is sort of intermediate geographically, see on this map. And this is an illustration of why archaeologists uh, were not terribly interested in Black Mountain, because you had the members pottery, which is pretty flashy, and the Pakime pottery, which is pretty flashy. For Black Mountain, which I think are, the, are members people who have at 1130 said, we're not members anymore. I mean, we're, we're who we are, but we're not doing this pottery, this ideologically charged pottery anymore. We're turning our backs on that, just like people turn their backs on tea doors. Um, and they start using pottery that doesn't have any painted designs at all, where, where the, the, the grandparents uh, ate their Wheaties out of that bowl on top with the two, whatever they are, probably bighorn sheep. The grandchildren of those people ate their Wheaties out of this bowl here that is a burnished, 
polished interior. It has no design in, inside. In fact, the ones that are really well polished, it's like an any design. It's like you can see your, your reflection in them. You can see your eyes in them. It's like they go from lots and lots of uh, artistic energy, what we would call artistic energy, on the interior bowls to just nothing. And they reinvent themselves. They change clothes. They, they turn their backs on whatever members was. Uh, reinvent themselves as Black Mountain and eventually, I think, um, wind up down at Pakime as part of the base population, bringing that whole uh, belief system that uh, gave them the really unusual, unique uh, subfloor burials. So this really violates the, the big data. I mean, you're going from Membris to Pakime that don't look anything like each other. But the, the clunky evidence, the subfloor burials are just, to me, too strong to ignore. And even though you know, Pakime doesn't look like members. Pakime that doesn't, Pakime the site doesn't look like member sites. I showed you pictures of those. Pottery does, well, it looks a little bit like, like members pottery. Um, it's that clunky evidence that, that uh, uh, can be so compelling, like T-shaped doors and triwall structures and subfloor burials. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm still working on, some of it's in, I've used in books like History of the Ancient Southwest or Study of Southwest Archaeology. Um, but it's fun. You know, while everybody else is doing the really flashy bells and whistles, uh, big data stuff, uh, I'm plodding along with, you know, with clunky things <laughs> that it seemed to me to be important. Like the T-shaped door meant something. Triwall structures really meant something. They were central to, to uh, Aztec, which was what which Aztec itself is the capital of, of what was going on in the Northern Southwest at that time. And the subfloor burials, I, you know, it's not just a, a bizarre practice. It's not for the people who are doing it. It's nothing bizarre about it at all. It's just how you do it. But nobody else did it in the Southwest except for those two, uh, um, I believe, historically related uh, um, societies, members, and then the final, you know, the last uh, capital in the Southwest, Pakimi. So that's it. Uh, I'd like to close uh, my part of this by saying that uh, uh, I've been a member of the Archaeological Institute of America for a long time and uh, involved with the local society for a long time. Uh, uh, Sarah didn't say this, but I know many of the societies, because there's, there's a lot of branch societies around the United States, had just stopped their uh, lecture series. But uh, Sarah and, and her people have kept it, are, are keeping it going with this, this webinar format, which I think is great. And trying to keep your, the membership uh, um, engaged and informed. And for those of you out there that might not be members, uh, think about it. Think about joining it. I'll, uh, I might tell you why in a minute. I don't know, one, one reason, anyway. Um, it has to do with Archaeology Magazine. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to Sarah James, if I have covered everything I'm supposed to cover, Sarah. If you're there. Are we good? Here. Thank you, Steve. That's great. Um, such a fascinating talk, and I'm, I'm happy to say we're getting questions coming from um, different directions here. Sarah, I don't know about anybody else. I can't hear you very well. Oh, you can't hear me. That's unfortunate. Um, other people might be able to, but... I, I sound okay to other people? Louder. <laughs> no? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, Thank perfect. you. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to say that we have questions from multiple directions. Um, thank you very much for that really interesting talk. Um, let's see, where, where shall we dive in? Um, so one of the questions is coming in from Caitlin. She asks, um, what's the reason to believe that the T door signifies a person rather than a function of the space you're entering, um, an activity that occurs outside, sort of inside, sorry, that occurs inside that space? Uh, I'm not sure I follow the question. What, what is the reason for thinking that the, the T door is? Uh, signifies a person or I think something's perhaps ritualistic or, or symbolic oh. rather than an activity that's going on inside that space. Oh, it's probably doing both. I mean, I, the T-shape, um, I, I tried to show on the mug handles and the uh, altar from, from Pocky made the T-shape means something. It is, it's, it's symbolic, okay? It means something. What it means, I, who knows, but, but it's pretty clear that 
whatever activity is going on in a room with the tea door is not the same thing as what's going on with that tea, tea altar. I mean, the, you know, the, the form is telling us something. The form is, is telling, telling them something. It's, it's communicating that, yeah, whatever this shape means, you know, I'm part of that deal. Um, there is a functional aspect to it in that they're almost all exterior doors. So you're going in and out of them all the time. Uh, you know, that's, that's the door to the outside world. The flip side of that is that's the door to the outside world. That's the door that the outside world sees. And, you know, it's what distinguishes it. There may have been many other things that distinguish these buildings. I mean, they might have painted them all kinds of colors. They might have had flags on top of them. Who knows? But from what the archaeologists can see, that's the most distinctive aspect of what's left in the ruins uh, that would communicate to somebody from the outside the, I, I'll say social identity. I don't know if that's quite what I mean, but the, uh, the the, I don't say social identity, of the people that are in that building. They're part of what, whatever that T means, and it means something, you know, it isn't, it isn't just functional. It probably isn't functional at all. Um, whatever it means that, the, that that building is occupied by people who buy into that. I don't know if that answered the, the question adequately. I, th I think that's, that's a, a really interesting question and a really good start to that, to that answer. That made sense to me, Steve. Um, I'll see if we get a follow-up question on that one. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you a question actually coming from our live Facebook feed. Um, someone was asking about um, Paclime and what the evidence for colonnades is at that site. At Paclime, um, there are extant colonnades. Uh, they're, they're, it's interesting because you know you're used to seeing colon. If you travel Mesoamerica, you're used to seeing colonnades made out of masonry. These are made out of massive adobe, which is not. It doesn't have a lot of compression strength, so, you, know, so you wouldn't want to put a big load on top of it. Um, but yeah, there are half a dozen, more than half a dozen uh, colonnades that Charlie de Peso found. Uh, where the, which were unambiguous, where you had you know, a row of columns. Um, again, it's, it's interesting because it's an idea that's a post-classic idea for Mexico, but it's being translated into a local material into this massive adobe. I mean, the adobe is pretty solid, but it, it's a material that uh, might not have been my first pick for building something like that. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, we have another great question coming in. Um, from the webinar. It is, what do you think's going on with D-shaped buildings in the region north of the tri-wall distribution? What, I'm not, I did hear the first part. What, what, what do I think of what shape buildings? Of with the D-shaped buildings. C-shaped? D. D as in dog? Correct. Oh, okay, I didn't talk about those. Um, there are other classes of, of interesting architecture in that region that, that uh, uh, I'm saying is Aztecs, you know, which includes some D-shaped structures that usually have, um, they're sort of half, half a tri-wall, if that makes sense. I mean, they have an arc of rooms uh, along the back of the D and then a the straight front. I don't have a picture of one I could show you. And then often a one key or two key was in the, in the middle of it. Uh, uh, Donna Glowacki, who's up at uh, um, Notre Dame, did a really good study of the distribution of those things. And they seem to be, uh, um, believe more to the west and the tri walls are more to the east in, the, in that area. Uh, I am obfuscating here because I don't have ideas. I don't know what a tri wall is. I don't know what a D-shaped building is, but it's interesting that they, you know, they have these fairly formalized, look like non-residential, uh, structures in most of the villages and you know that what's up with that I mean it's a it's a strong pattern it's it's I love it because it's clunky evidence right there's not that many d-shaped buildings either it's clunky evidence um, which you don't necessarily necessarily have to put in a computer and put through algorithms I mean you sit there and think about it uh, I thought about it and I can't answer that question so I'll let somebody else think about it some younger person smarter than me <laughs> I think perhaps the person who posed that question might be interested in that particular um, issue. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those were our kind of specific architecture questions. Then we have a few more general ones. Um, 
This one comes from Robert. He said, um, would the materials available to potters at Black Mountain have permitted them to continue with the Mimbre style of design had they chosen to do so? Or were the necessary materials simply not available to them, which would explain the radical departure in design? Well, that's a good question. And um, it's not clear to me. And you know, Katie Put Savage did a bunch of, X, I think, XRF or INAA on, on, on her pottery from her excavations at Black Mountain. And some of it's made there. But an awful lot of it's made other places, um, but it's being chosen, you know, like the, those bowls with the, the uh, um, smudged burnished interior, the black interiors, those are being made a lot all over the uh, Mogollon Highlands in the same area that, that Members was being made prior, uh, previously. Um, and they're bringing a lot of those into to Black Mountain. It's like they, they sort of lose enthusiasm for pottery making altogether. They're, I think they're mainly making, and, and Katie's dissertations on online, they're mainly making the, the utility wares, the, the brownware jars and stuff like that. Um, it's a good question, because uh, to make the members, um, uh, Daryl Creels and, and some other people done excellent work on sourcing where a members pottery is made. And the, the base clays are, uh, from alluvial clays and rock clays in various parts of the members world and they're making it all over the place. But the slip, the white slip, I and mean, this is interesting, uh, and, and I don't think we've narrowed down where that's coming from because the clays that are using fire and under the conditions that they fire them, uh, fire gray, brown gray. Um, so that white slip's really important to the black and white design. You can't have a black and white design unless you get white. And there's a couple sources of kaolin clay and they're very localized, and that, get, that stuff gets traded around. Uh, to get back to the, the question, which is an excellent question, yeah, that could be one, one reason why they're not doing it, but there's still members people, other, not like all the members people go out in the desert. Some of them go over towards the Rio Grande where Peggy Nelson's been studying them. Some of them probably go up in, go up in the mountains, um, but all of them quit painting that pottery. They, 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 they quit making the, the members black and white. Uh, especially the stuff that has all the pictures of people cutting people's heads off and you know on one pot or a bunny on the other or whatever those the, the, those kinds of pots just end interesting this is this is a good segue into another question that we've had come up um i know that in your career as a museum curator you've dealt pretty extensively with um southwest pottery and um I heard a rumor that you're going to be involved um, in a new podcast series from the CU Museum of Natural History um, that's going to be available soon. Um, that's giving a behind the scene look at the careers of some of CU's curators. And I was wondering, you know, what kind of sparked your initial interest in um, museum work and being a scientist in a museum setting? Well, um... When I was a kid, my dad was in the army. When I was a kid, we lived in Naples, Italy for three years. He was assigned over there. And we go see Herculaneum and Pompeii and everything else under the sun. And Sarah, you'll like this. I originally wanted to be a classical archeologist, <laughs> but I got sidetracked into anthropological archeology span in North America. Uh, I went to school first couple of years at a place called Beloit College up in Wisconsin. And that's, that's always been a pipeline historically to the Southwest. But Logan Museum has their old, really nice old uh, uh, anthropology museum. And I did a lot of work with the collections there and, and thought that was pretty good, pretty good gig. Um, and subsequently went on to you know, go to the Southwest. And I should point out that the woman who now runs Logan Museum uh, is a graduate of our museum studies program. Uh, yeah, one of our many success stories in the CU, this, the University of Colorado Museums, uh, uh, museum studies program. So I, I wanted to be a museum curator because I didn't really want to be a professor. Um, and the job that I finally got at CU was a bit of both, but it was more heavy on the museum than it was on the professorial stuff. I, thought, I like professors, some of my best friends are professors, but, but I, that wasn't really the path I wanted to go on. And what I really wanted to do was, was be a research curator in a museum, um, much like Indiana Jones. I didn't realize this, but until the last movie, his, his office was in the boiler room of the museum of whatever college that made up college he was he supposedly lived in. So that's what got me going. Uh, I love working in collections. Um, every time you open up a drawer, you get a surprise. Sometimes it's not a good surprise, but you, know, you get a surprise. 
that's great. Thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure if, if people want to learn more about your story, um, they can enjoy that new podcast called Museum Unlocked. Um, we have a couple other questions that have come in um, in the meantime. Uh, let's see. This one's from Marilyn. She asks, um, wasn't there a subfloor burial of a woman in the oldest part of Pueblo Benito found a while ago? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I say nobody else does it, the, the only exception to that is, is Pueblo Benito, uh, where they um, rather more elaborate uh, in the oldest part of the building, because I, I think I mentioned earlier, it took about a century and a half to build that thing. And you know, they just they kept adding on and adding on and adding on. In the heart of it, in the oldest part of it, they uh, um, dug a crypt, uh, a uh, woodline crypt, and I don't think it was log line. I think it was carpentry. There's a lot of carpentry that we don't get to see anymore because it's all gone. So it was a, a woodline crypt underneath the floor of this one room that nobody was using at that point. I mean, this is like at that point it, it, it was the oldest part of the building, so it had gotten buried almost. It was a sub basement, and that crypt was where they put all the really important people. Uh, the the story is you know there's a guy two guys down at the bottom uh, one of whom at least died a violent death buried with all the wealth in the world I mean one of them's lying on a, a cape of turquoise beads and you know he's got all this stuff and then people on top of them uh, not piled on top of them when they were buried but they, periodically they'd reopen the crypt and put somebody else in and they did some DNA work on that and it turned out that uh, almost everybody in that royal tomb uh, was related uh, on their mom's side, on the female side. So it's it's some kind of a dynasty or whatever. And, and uh, the other interesting thing is those two guys that were buried in that old crypt were right there at the beginning, which makes sense. Uh, you know, they, they, they were able to date the two guys at the bottom and uh, they were there when they started building Polo Benito. Uh, presumably they were alive at that point. Um, so yeah, that's a subfloor burial, um, and you know, there's a few more around the Southwest. That, you know, obviously, the one at Chaco is really exceptional because it's this high-status thing where the, you know these these guys these are the nobles. I mean, these, you know, they're getting treated in this way. Um, there's there's in many parts of the Southwest, if you have a a baby that doesn't make it, um, stillborn, whatever, they get buried under the you know just under the floor near a hearth. And again, this crosses cultural areas. Um, not everybody does that, but, but a lot of people do that. So, it, but it isn't the kind of thing where I'm talking about where you dig a hole in the corner, you know, have a formal burial with an adult and the pots and all that kind of stuff. The, the baby, that's something like being buried in a midden where the baby's gonna come back as, as a, another person. So yeah, there's, there's some subfloor burials. The one in Chaco is, Quite remarkable. I mean, that's a different ball, a whole different ballpark, different strata, stratum, uh, than the uh, members and the Pocky May burials, and then the odd one here and there. But by and large, yeah, it's just members and, and Pocky May, emphatically. But good, good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about Pocky May again, we have um, another question. This one's um, from Randy asking. Um, he assumes that the Spaniards came across some of these ancient sites, especially Pakime. Um, are there any observations about them in their records? That's, there's a wonderful story. Obregon, um, one of the one of the not the earliest conquistadors, not the Coronados and the Espejos and people like that, but uh, when they finally colonized New Mexico, they come up through. Pocky May. I don't know how much time I've got. This is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish come up, you know, and, and it's a big expedition. They're going to colonize New Mexico finally. And so it's, you know, they got herds of cattle and sheep and families and Indian allies, you know, regiments of, of uh, flesh columns. Um, and they come by Pocky May and, and it's standing, you know, it's even more spectacular then. I mean, this is whatever this is, you know, 16th century. Um, so there's a lot more of it standing. And they, they stop there and they go, wow, look at this. And they ask the local people, we don't know who the local people are, but there are local people there. And they ask them, what's up with this? Who, you know, what, what happened here? And they said, well, we didn't build this, but we know the story. And the story was that there are two 
brothers marching out of the north who were who, who were kings. And I'm I'm sort of paraphrasing the uh, Spanish accounts. They were sons of kings and princes of great power with all their people, and they each had their own groups of uh, their warriors and their courts and that kind of stuff. Not not like the Spanish with all the peasants and commoners, but they, you know they're they're marching down there, and they stumble on this old hag uh, who's carrying a huge iron rock, right? Huge iron rock. And she stops him and he says, brother number one, I'm gonna toss this rock and you build a city where the rock lands. And the brother number two, you keep going. <laughs> and so that's how it gets built. Well, when they, in the 1860s, some of the guys from the little city, the little town of Casas Grandes Viejo, which is right next to the ruins, uh, are out there looking for treasure, you know, whatever they can find. And they're digging away and they hit this big old meteorite, you know, big meteorite <laughs> that, you know, like four feet long. I mean, this is not, not a tiny little thing. And it's now in the Smithsonian. There's this long story about how it got to Smithsonian. But they found it in an archaeological context. They said it was wrapped up in cloth. It was in, they called it in a temple. I don't know what that means. Um, but yeah, there was the iron rock <laughs> that the, the hag said, you know, you build your, build your uh, city here. So that's the earliest Spanish account of the place. And it's one that I like a lot. There's some other ones too, but we don't have all night. I could go on all night about colonial accounts. Well, that is a marvelous story. Um, it is a good story. <laughs> and you can, you can so go much. see the, you can see the meteorite. It's, a, it's on, on display, or it was on display in the Smithsonian. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful story. I think we will we will end your webinar on this um, happy note, and maybe I'll start googling, um, start googling that wonderful rock in the Smithsonian. I'm curious to see what it looks like right now. Um, so, thanks again. I just want to remind um, everyone that um, this lecture has been recorded. It's going to be available in a few days on our um, AIA YouTube page. Um, so please check in with the museum and check in with our Boulder Society page, uh, aiaboulder.wordpress.com. And um, yes, I hope to see you all at our next lecture, which will be on October 28th by Dr. Aaron Baxter talking about Colorado cemeteries. And um, please check all those places to find out how to log in and register for that webinar. Thanks again, Stephen. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks. Bye.